Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk about Oscar Valdez winning the 130 pound championship as an underdog over Miguel Burchell. But first, remember the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say up front, the fight did not go the way I thought it would. I personally thought the bigger Burchild would win by stoppage. Right? A good big man usually beats a good little man, especially when they're fighting over the pocket. But we're not going to cry over spilled milk because the hedge delivered. Valdez simply to win got you greater than three to one odds. Gamblers profited the pre-fight video is still up. This is why we look for value in fights. Let me also point out that the recommended bet, which was Burchelled by KO, hedged with Valdez simply to win. You knew you had that after Valdez's fast start. After he hurt and dropped Burchelled. Right? You knew you had that in the middle rounds because you understood. The only way Burchild was going to win this fight was by stoppage. Right? If he could do it. Otherwise, the challenger was going to take the title, whether by decision or by stoppage. Burchild was that beaten. Now, was that Joe Fraser with the left hook and head movement? or Oscar Valdez. Let me back up a little bit here. Oscar Valdez is that rare great fighter who wants to be greater. While some fighters lose and then change trainers. Think Lennox Lewis. Think Vladimir Klitschko. Valdez, who's still unbeaten, was unbeaten when he switched to Canelo's trainer, Eddie Reynoso, to improve his defense. In other words, this guy had the world on a string, was unbeaten. Keep in mind, he was the featherweight champ. He decides, you know what? There are holes in my game I need to improve. I need to work on my defense. Well, folks, the improvement showed. Wow. Wow. Here's what surprised me. Valdez is a hunter. He's front foot heavy. Right? I view him as a mid-range hooker. Now, he came out and he started fast. If you have a film of the fight, I want you to key on commentator Andre Ward's statements. Right? Valdez, the smaller man. Ward tells you early on, and I thought Ward had a tremendous night. Ward tells you early on that he'd like for Valdez, the smaller man, to stay small, to fight small. In other words, you're up against a murderous body puncher, right? A mid-range hooker, a bigger man, who's eventually going to try to walk you down. Although Burchell in the first round is on his best behavior, right? He's a slow starter. So Ward's telling you he wanted the smaller Valdez to bend at the waist, to cover his body, to stay contained, to not overextend himself, right? Ward starts talking about stamina early in this fight. He starts talking about the aggression that Valdez comes out with and how it's using his energy. In other words, you're in with a big man who's playing chess, right? Burchell deliberately is feeling out Valdez in the first round. You have to know from Burchell's history that he's going to throw over 80 punches around, right? That he's going to be offensive, that he's going to try to impose himself on you as this fight goes along. So Ward's telling you, hey, look, Valdez needs to stay within his defensive envelope. 
He needs to not overextend himself. He needs to think about the later rounds in the early rounds. He can't spend all of his capital when Burchell is 100% and has just started the fight. Well, as round two progresses, you notice Burchell starts to come forward. Right? This is the Burchell we know. He's lost the first round. You can tell he's having a problem with Valdez's hand speed. But the Valdez who comes out in the first round is overtly aggressive. Right? He wants the belt at 130. He's not deferential in the slightest. He looks like he's willing to trade with a guy who has a KO percentage over 80% career. I want people to appreciate the holy grail of boxers that they show on the telecasts and film clips before this fight. They point out to you that Burchell's KO percentage <laughs> is higher than Julio Cesar Chavez's KO percentage. Right? They show you Alexis Arguello in the early clips of this fight. They show you Diego Corrales, another big-time puncher in the early clips. So what ESPN here in the United States was doing was telling you, this guy's a puncher. What Andre Ward was telling you was, look, the smaller Valdez, who himself was a puncher at feather, this fight's at super featherweight, needed to pace himself, need to, needed to expect the storm to come. Storm starts to come in the second round. Burchell starts to come forward. That's when we get big time surprises. Right? The first big surprise for me. Valdez, a hunter. A guy who knocks you out. A guy who's not hiding in the ring. Wants to trade with you normally. Mentally, is able to make the adjustment. And this surprised me. He was able to make the adjustment where Burchell is walking him down, at least trying to. Burchell's on his front foot, and Valdez, who's usually alpha, in other words, he's usually the guy on his front foot, is comfortable being beta. He's backing up, right? He's not going to spend his capital trying to draw a line in the sand against a puncher who's 100%. No, the bigger man's coming forward. Valdez has made a decision, and it shows early in this fight, to back away from the pocket, to go over by the ropes. Right? It's Valdez who's on his back foot. He doesn't even give up any of his energy. He's in against a bigger man who's a puncher. Rather than throw a lot of punches, be blood and guts, trade, land big shots, show this big man, hey, I'm here. After a first round where he's aggressive, in the second round, he just starts backing up. I was surprised by that. And he's calm. It's not a psychic blow to his ego where he looks uncertain. No, there's always a method to Valdez's madness. Right? So Burchell's coming forward. Valdez backs away. He throws a few punches in there, but he's not going to allow himself to get battered. Trying to keep going forward. Also, I thought it was interesting. This was as big a shock to me. Valdez, like Joe Fraser, like his stablemate Canelo, has his head on a swivel. Here's the defensive part. Right? Burchell is a mid-range hooker. Burchell's coming in. He has a perfunctory jab that, as I said in the pre-fight video, he doesn't want to live off of. He doesn't want to bludgeon you with the jab. 
right? The jab is just a distraction so he could come in and start landing hooks. So he comes in, starts to try to land hooks. Valdez is bobbing and weaving. And he's fighting small. So Burchell can't find his head. Right? You'll notice. Look look on the film. Valdez keeps moving his head. It's a constant. Right? He's conscious of where his head is. He doesn't want to stop moving it and be a stationary target. So he's moving his head. You'll notice he's fighting small. So, Burchell, who is a body puncher, can't find his body because Valdez is bent over, right? Valdez, while he's moving his head, is bent over to protect his body, right? You can take him out of the fight and put in Joe Fraser. Same thing. Same dangerous left hook. Let me also say this too. Burchell, and this is a big difference between the fighters. Burchell's predetermined. Right? He is the football team that wants to run the football. Right? This is a Vince Lombardi mindset. We're going to do the sweep regardless of what the defense does. They can't stop us. That's his mindset. If I just throw down my game, he can't stop me. So Burchell, whatever Valdez is doing, is trying to come forward with volume, throwing hooks as he tries to get Valdez on the ropes. Right, so understand, this Burchell fight is the same fight that Burchell's had against others. He's coming forward. He's throwing hooks. He's willing to get hit with some shots because he thinks his shots are harder than yours. So he's predetermined. He understands he's having a hard time finding Valdez's head. But he keeps throwing hooks. The idea is, I'm the champ. Sooner or later, I'm going to hit pay dirt here. Right? He's not the kind of fighter who comes in and says, you know what? This guy still has his reflexes. This guy is still alert. The fight's just started. This guy's not tired yet. His reflexes haven't dimmed. Right? Let me shelve this strategy for another couple rounds. That's not who Burchell is. He's also not a guy, even though he's physically bigger than Valdez. To then say, okay, you know what? Plan B is not working here. Since this guy's moving his head out of the way of everything I throw, let me start with feints to see where he goes with his head. Let me confuse him a little bit. Let me not throw punches. See where he's going. Then I can throw the punch. Once I know where he's going. Let me figure out his head movement before I throw more punches. That's not Burchell. By contrast, that's Valdez. Valdez isn't predetermined. He's tailored. He's making the adjustments. He also has a plan that's specific for Burchell. Right? Valdez knows the counter left hook is open. He knows that. He knows that Burchell is lackadaisical when he comes in. He knows, too, that Burchell has convinced himself that he can take chin shots with the best of them. So in my opinion, Valdez makes a decision to not aim for Burchell's chin. 
he starts aiming for higher up on Burchell's head. I know it sounds ridiculous, folks. It's effective. Understand, I agree with Timothy Bradley that the first knockdown wasn't a real knockdown. That Burchell was pushed to the canvas. But understand, the reason Burchell was able to be pushed to the canvas was because he gets hit with a left hook on the top of his head. Think Golovkin, who also likes to hit guys up around the top of their head. Right? Here, Valdez has an A-plus left hook. That's another surprise for me. I knew he was a mid-range hooker. I knew his hooks... He was a puncher. His, his hooks were good. Folks, his left hook is a plus. He lands some great right hands in this fight. But nothing carries the power of his left hook. Valdez's left hook up top is his best punch. So he lands it up top on Burchell. And folks, I, I did not expect this. Burchell's hurt in the worst way. His legs are gone. To me, this is worse than temporarily blacking out. Right? Hitting the canvas. Tyson Fury against Deontay Wilder, the 12th round. Where Fury hits the canvas and he's out. He's out. Then he comes to, during the count. Then he gets off the canvas, beats the count, and still is coordinated. To me, that's not as bad as what happened to Burchell yesterday. Burchell got hit, and while he was conscious, he lost control of his legs. Right? This is early in the fight. So then you notice he barely makes it to the end of one round. You notice he has problems walking to his corner. You notice he has problems standing up. Now he may have been completely alert, but neurologically his legs weren't there. So then he ends up on the canvas. I didn't see the clean punch. I got the feeling a stiff wind would put him on the canvas. Then he ends up on the canvas, then he gets off the canvas, and he's completely wobbly. Completely wobbly. Right, so Valdez, who may have thought going in, hey, I'm, I'm the underdog here. I'm a better than three to one underdog in this fight. I'm fighting a big man. At that point, Valdez had to realize it's his fight to lose, understand. Andre Ward gives Valdez the first three rounds of the fight. Timothy Bradley starts pleading with Valdez to throw an uppercut. In other words, Bradley wants Valdez going blood and guts in the pocket. Well, what you had was Valdez making sure he's moving along the ropes making sure he's staying crouched, moving his head. And you'd notice when he throws the left hook, his Sunday punch, he would pivot to the right of Burchell. So what's interesting are the punches he misses. You'll notice he times it well, where when Burchell gets a little lackadaisical, you'll notice that Valdez throws left hooks that miss. This happens three or four times during the fight. Where had the punch landed, and you notice too, Burchell never commits to putting a hand up to guard against the left hook. You'll notice Burchell never commits to smothering the left hook because Burchell's predetermined. The defense that worked in his last fight is going to work in this fight, or so he thought. So Burchell gets his legs back, but by that point, he's down big in the fight. Big. 
He needs the knockout, and unfortunately for him, he's still at a hand speed disadvantage. He still can't find Valdez's head. Let's just say when Valdez finishes the show, predictably off a left hook, I want people to look at Burchell carefully. He hits the canvas in pieces. He's so bad off that when they announce the winner, keep in mind there's a pause while people tend to Burchell, who's on the canvas a long time. When he gets off the canvas and is in a chair, did you notice that when the referee goes over to raise the hand of Valdez, Burchell can't even be part of the ceremony. I believe his legs are still gone. Right? The shots that hurt him, he developed an iron chin. He can strengthen his neck and chin muscles. He wasn't ready for shots higher up on his head. And he's not only not defensively blessed, he's completely defensively clueless. So that Oscar Valdez effective left hook early never gets dampened. I mean never gets dampened. Right? That's a great punch. So let's talk about 130 because it suddenly got interesting. Right? You have Gervonta Davis, another banger. Right? Another banger who wants to get in the pocket at 130. You also have Shakur Stevenson who wouldn't be phased by the hand speed. Who has length? The concern with Stevenson is whether he'd be able to stay outside on Oscar Valdez. I mean, keep in mind, Valdez in this fight is fighting short. You're looking at the fight and you're wondering why Burchell doesn't rely more heavily on a jab. Winning rounds behind the jab. Right? Just out boxing, landing, sticking, and moving. The question is, does Valdez move well enough to crowd Shakur Stevenson? If he doesn't, Stevenson, Southpaw, might be able to stay outside, pump a jab, right? Stay away, make the defensive adjustment, stay away and be aware of Valdez's leaping left hook. Right? You can't fight small against a mover unless you're prepared to move aggressively like Joe Fraser did against Ali. Stevenson, Valdez, has an Ali, Joe Fraser, feel to it. Right? Gervonta Davis and Valdez, Davis to me is better than advertised. Davis is structured and tailored. People need to understand that Davis has beaten people like Jose Pedraza. Davis is tailored. If he's making mistakes in the early rounds, like Burchell is here, he's not going to make the mistakes in the later rounds. Right? Davis, Valdez, that's a great fight. If I'm with Burchell, I stay away from Valdez. I mean, understand, Burchell's already in his later 20s. He's defensively clueless. He's not going to learn defense now. 
right? I mean, I don't know how else to put it, right? Both men now know that Valdez could knock him out. Burchell was talking about moving up in weight. There's a lot of action at 135. I think if I'm Burchell, who looks like he had to lose a lot of weight to make weight, these guys didn't even look like they were the same size. Right? If I'm Burchell, maybe at 28, it's time for me to have dessert. Maybe my body's punishing me for having to lose a lot of weight right before a fight. If I'm Burchell, I take time off, right? His legs look that bad, folks. He's going to have to see a neurologist. I take time off, then I move up to 135. Right? Understand, that's the land of Teofimo Lopez for now. I would stay away from Lopez. Right? Lopez has an excellent jab. I, I don't even believe Lopez has to come inside to beat Burchell. Right? I would venture more toward guys with lighter punches at 135. Well, Let's just say this makes boxing a lot more interesting. Let me also recognize someone other than the fighter who had a great night. And other than Andre Ward, who I thought had a great night. Understand how good the telecast was. Timothy Bradley was saying he needs to throw uppercuts. Andre Ward was saying, no, he needs to throw left hooks. You had two champions talking chess during the telecast telling you what punch would win the day. Ward was right. Valdez closes the show on a devastating left hook, right? You realize that Valdez's left hooks were the punch of the fight, right? Also, both men were admiring the fact that Valdez was moving along the ropes. In other words, Valdez didn't want to fall asleep and be cornered on the ropes. So Valdez made sure that when he was up against the ropes, he moved. When he had the opportunity to pivot to the middle of the ring, he did. Both champions, Ward and Bradley, were telling you why that was special. Right? Ward also was emphasizing Valdez's need to fight small. That was essential. But not only did the announcers have a great day, Eddie Reynoso, wow. I mean, folks, I can't wait to see heavyweight Andy Ruiz, who's now with Reynoso, right? Because as far as I'm concerned, Andy still has the fastest hands in the heavyweight division. You've seen great head movement from Canelo. Well, let's just say I looked at several Oscar Valdez fights before this one, before making the pre-fight video. Wow, Oscar was on his game defensively here. Right? Don't just congratulate Oscar, who had a great night. Congratulate his corner. Understand, this corner is relatively new in Oscar's career. And they've already synced with their fighter who now has the belt at 130. This is interesting. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Tell us what surprised you. Tell us what you expected. Tell us the future. I know there are other people in the mix. Ryan Garcia, right? Maybe Lomachenko is in the mix. Tell us what you think happens here at the 130-135 neighborhood. I suspect Teofimo Lopez is going to have to move up to 140 shortly. Right? I suspect... Some guys who look bulletproof right now, Ryan Garcia, are going to look awfully young in some fights against some of these older fighters, uh, some of these hard-hitting fighters, right? Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.